Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it is a tough act to follow. In fact, Dr. Joe kind of touched on some of the things I'm going to be talking about briefly. Since my section is Philadelphia indoor soccer, I get to do like the stand-up comedian thing. Anyone here from Philly? <laughs> All right. I know Coach Bill. In fact, two guys were in a film. We were in a film together in the summertime, uh, Coach Billis and, and uh, Roger Alloway. Anyway, um, it's a good segue following Dr. Joe to talk about Philadelphia because Philadelphia really was the, the, the site of the Big Bang of what we know as modern indoor soccer now. But it's, it's kind of lucky, though, because as opposed to notwithstanding its proximity to New York and the fact that, and notwithstanding the fact that Philadelphia had a bunch of arenas and, and armories <coughs> and gymnasiums, indoor soccer really didn't bubble up as much in the city of brotherly love as it would in New York. Uh, even though we really have an excuse, because like New York, we had a Newark slash Carney of our own called Camden. Nevertheless, we really, we were kind of slow to, to take to indoor soccer. Um, but again, as fate would have it, it wound up being the birthplace. Notwithstanding, it's funny, indoor soccer popped up in southwest PA, in a place called Monaco Hill, about as far southwest as you could go without being in West Virginia, uh, in 1907. And, uh, and Pittsburgh was playing a version of indoor soccer in 1908. You didn't see it pop up in Philadelphia until uh, January of 1911. Although, interestingly, unlike in New York and a lot of other places where they were trying to go 11 v 11 under a roof, the early versions in Philadelphia uh, were five to side, uh, three full, two fullbacks and three forwards. Um, and they were playing at uh, Cooper Battalion Hall, which is still around at 23rd and Christian. Uh, a team called Greystock played Mediator FC in a three-game series, and it was fun, and then they moved on. Uh, in Philadelphia, for, for whatever reason, uh, there was a lot more of an effort to, to bring indoor gridiron football into play. Um, in fact, actual gridiron football games, <coughs> such as it was at the time, is again, even when you go to the turn of the, uh, the 20th century, it wasn't quite what we see, we see today. It's still <laughs> kicking, um, but as early as 1889, they were doing indoor gridiron exhibitions, or what they would call goal kicking exhibitions, in of all places, the Academy of Music, which is still around on Broad Street. Um, but as it turns out, in a city that uh, embraced a relatively new game of basketball pretty wholeheartedly and pretty quickly, and the fact that Philadelphia didn't get quite the same waves of immigration that New York had. I mean, they'd get that Los Angeles, they'd get to New York, and they'd kind of stay there. Not, there wasn't a whole lot of that second wave of immigration. There wasn't a whole lot of push to develop, again, indoor soccer, while outdoor soccer was thriving. Again, in the wintertime, they had basketball, they had other things to do. They weren't really um, incentivizing developing indoor soccer as a winter alternative. Across the river in Camden, however, the local YMCA, uh, in October of 1913, began offering classes on indoor soccer. It was at the beginning of pay to play. Uh, I think the YMCA was doing it for free. But they were at least offering classes, and you know, newspapers were talking about, oh, indoor soccer is really popular. It's going to be as big as basketball. But no leagues would pop up. These kids learned it, and they went on their way. Um, by 1915, full-sided indoor soccer started to pop up in Philadelphia at the church club in Howard and Somerset Streets, and now it's a grocery store. Um, in, in 1924, the sport made a reluctant indoor appearance. The uh, annual inner city championship was getting snowed out, and rather than wait, uh, they decided to move it indoors and hold it as a one-off event. But these earlier examples are really kind of ad hoc. Again, weather-related, or two teams said, hey, let's play a couple games. Um, in Philadelphia, I guess the sport, closer to what we know it, uh, as we know it today, it made its society debut, if you will, at a charity event in March of 1932. Um, a, a, a charity event for the emergency aid of Philadelphia, um, big on taking care of World War I veterans and things like that, held a winter carnival at the 103rd Cavalry Armory, and as you'll hear from Dave, I mean, armories figure a lot in indoor soccer. Uh, March of 1932 was a sporting event, sort of a winter carnival sporting event. Field hockey, women played field hockey, brought in lacrosse, they had a lacrosse game, and indoor soccer. 
the indoor soccer it was five aside, and in a theme that you'll hear going forward, was billed as more exciting than the outdoor game. You'll hear that a lot. Uh, the indoor game did feature Hot Ryan, Philadelphia native, U.S. Men's national team legend. He was one of the players on the bill. Uh, I actually wrote a lot about the, that event for a lacrosse a history website. So if you go to retrolax.com and you want to read more about it, it's there about the, the event itself. Um, but, uh, but while, again, that charity event was a success, lots of money was raised, people liked what they saw. Again, no burning desire to, to make indoor soccer something more formal, something other than an exhibition, something other than a training exercise. Um, going forward, Philadelphia's involvement was, uh, at least in, in, in indoor soccer, was primarily at the professional level, following along with the American Soccer League would be trying. Uh, the American Soccer League would, uh, would, would, would try indoor tournaments at Madison Square Garden, 1939, 1941, and, you know, 1958. Although, uh, and again, even with the ASL, largely exhibitions. It wasn't until um, 1950 when the National Soccer League of Chicago decided staging, started staging annual indoor soccer leagues with their teams uh, and were getting it televised that people started paying attention to indoor soccer as maybe this is something we ought to try picking up. Indeed, a little side note, it's not Philadelphia, but in 1953, the National Soccer League was so popular that they tried an intercity league, including teams from Detroit, St. Louis, Toledo, Milwaukee. In some ways, the, the first, uh, you know, um, the first, I won't say professional, but you know, the first indoor soccer league that was beyond just one city um, didn't take off because Chicago was a pretty parochial. They only wanted to watch their teams. Uh, but people started looking more and more at indoor as, as something that could be done, as something more than just an exhibition, more than just a training tool. And Philadelphia was tangentially involved. In 1965, the Atlantic City Convention Center, uh, which had hosted uh, minor league basketball, hockey for, for many years, decided to take a stab in indoor soccer. And, and what I guess you could call uh, the American Soccer League kind of a version of, a, of, a, of the Winter Classic. They started playing one game a year indoor. They counted in the league stands. Indoors in Atlantic City, uh, typically featuring the Philadelphia Ukrainian Nationals. Um, and in fact, on December 12, 1965, they played a game on artificial turf, which was, might be the first use of artificial turf for indoor soccer, as far as I can find. And about 2,000 fans came out to watch an 11 v 11 match, uh, the Philadelphia Ukes against the New York Ukes, you know, a bit of a success. Um, they didn't do it in 66, but they did do it in 67, Philadelphia Ukrainian Nationals against the Newark Ukrainian Stitch. Um, uh, and, uh, and it went well. And they also had a little um, uh, beauty contest to crown Miss Soccer, and I can't pronounce the name, but uh, uh, shockingly, the winner was a, a young woman of Ukrainian descent. Go figure, right? So, beauty. Probably. But, um, so, but again, progress. So, like Chicago and New York, you know, Philadelphia had a vibrant outdoor local league, the United Soccer League. Um, and in 1969, the Philadelphia League decided, hey, Chicago's been doing it for years, although ironically it was winding down in Chicago by 69 because they lost their army. Um, the United Soccer League tried, they sponsored an indoor, they put together an indoor league sponsored by Schmidt's Beer. Who remembers Schmidt's Beer? Yeah, right? Um, uh, and in 1969, they played games out of the Philadelphia Arena, which was, uh, you know, up until the time the Spectrum came, was where the uh, Sixers played their basketball games, a uh, number of games, you know, big time arena. In 1970, the league came back, still sponsored by Schmitz, but now they're playing Archbishop Ryan High School. Again, kind of a theme you see, the indoor starts here, it starts <coughs> winding down. Um, Archbishop Ryan is at least memorable, produced two uh, very famous, well, one, at least one very famous indoor player from the 90s, uh, Matt Knowles. Uh, and uh, Jody Bertal, who played a little bit, also came out of there. Um, there was no league in 1971, but it came back in 72, no sponsor, and now playing Northeast High School. Um, 
and after that the league faded away. But um, while that's going on, things are stirring across the river. In 1972, there was plans to build a big, modern, multi-sport indoor arena in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. If you know the area, right off of 295 where the Wegmans is now, that's where the arena was going to be. And because of that, and it was supposed to open in 75, because of that, some clever individuals decided to get ahead of the curve. And in 1972, the owners of the awful, moribund Cherry Hill Arena, and if you're hockey fans, it's infamous, uh, um, they decided they were going to start uh, an indoor soccer league. And then the World Indoor Soccer League and some ASL teams are going to participate. And in, uh, in September 72, there was going to be a tournament, and that got flooded out because the ice from the rink was coming up uh, on the turf. Uh, they rescheduled for October. In the end, it didn't happen. And in the end, they, they gave up because pretty quickly it was becoming clear the Mount Law Arena was not going to get built. A number of injunctions were filed, you know, wetlands and all that other stuff. And so that was abandoned. But in a way, it didn't matter. Because in 1973, the Philadelphia Adams pop up and take American soccer by storm. Expansion team, they win the NASL title in their first year, playing uh, you know, usually six Americans at a time, which uh, unless you were the St. Louis Stars, Americans weren't playing in the North American Soccer League. So Philadelphia was suddenly hot as a soccer market. And that winter, the Russian Red Army came over and they scheduled a series of six exhibitions against NASL teams and an NASL All-Star team. And in February, it was only natural they were going to play the defending champions. So on February 11, 1974, they came, they played at the Spectrum. 11,790 people came to watch. The Russians won 6-3 to three ultimately. The Russians continued their tour, and the Adams went back to getting ready to defend their title. So why was this exhibition so important? Well, as Dr. Joe indicated, among the 11,790 in attendance was a gentleman named Ed Tepper, who was there because he was the owner of the Philadelphia Wings box across team, a team that was going to start playing that spring. And he was there to watch the game, not because he cared anything at all about soccer, uh, but he wanted to see if artificial turf would work in box across, because traditionally that was played on a hard plywood surface. Instead, he decided he kind of liked what he saw. And Ed Foreman was there, because Ed Foreman was, uh, his brother in law was Ed Snyder, who owned the Spectrum and owned the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, they say, we may be on to something here. So uh, Mr. Foreman and Mr. Tepper were talking about, hey, maybe we can do something with this. And uh, by 1978, the major indoor soccer league was born. Now you talk about rules. There's a little anecdote I wanted to throw out there. As Dr. Joe said, in the old NESL exhibitions, because they had an indoor tournament in 75 and in 76, and the tornado, I think, had one in 71, the goals were four feet by 16 feet. You can see all those old pictures. It's kind of an odd look. Tepper, Foreman, Dr. Joe, the people involved said, we want, to get, we want to keep heading in the game. It's kind of, you know, we should, we should have heading. So the goal, should be a little, uh, the goal should be a little taller. And someone asked, and Tepper, well, how, well, how, how tall should, should they be? And at the time, he was standing in the door jam. So he's like, well, how about this? Is that so long of being six feet? So science, right? Really technical. So Philadelphia had a team in the NASL, Philadelphia Fever. Uh, who sold out their first game um, and led the league in attendance that year, about 8,000 a game. Where other places were kind of struggling, Cincinnati didn't draw at all, uh, New York struggled, uh, but the Fever had over 8,000 a game, had a sellout, and that was important because it convinced some other people that, hey, there might be a future in this game, and so, it, uh, so people like uh, the folks from St. Louis were incentivized to come in, and of course, when St. Louis came in, it, it, it really started to take off, and then later Kansas City after a couple of franchise moves, and professional indoor soccer was off and running. Now, unfortunately, the Fever weren't around to see it. Uh, they were gone by '82. Uh, professional indoor soccer would return with the Philadelphia Kicks in 1996, and that was another team, pretty successful at the Cape. Philadelphia liked indoor soccer. As a rule, though, they only liked it if Philadelphians were playing. So that's what that was the problem with the Fever. The first year with the Fever. United Soccer League All-Star team, basically, sprinkled with Joey Fink and Freddie Gregora, a couple ringers, if you will, as opposed to his arrows, who are all ringers, um, 
Uh, but, you know, lunging for the brass ring, we got a win. They, they got rid of the local kids. They brought in Philadelphia Fury players and the fans were disinterested. Kicks kind of had the same problem. They had a lot of, you know, the Maddie Knowles, they had a lot of local guys. People came out and it would be good, but not great. So we started cycling the local guys out. They were winning championships, but the people stopped coming. But the kicks found a good, you know, they, they hit a good, uh, they found a happy meeting. They were doing well. The problem is they lost their arena. The Spectrum got blown up to make way for a bar, basically. And, the only, and they weren't going to pay the Wells Fargo Center premium, so they went to the Wachovia Center, uh, Temple Basketball Arena, that unfortunately was only built for basketball. So they're one year there, they were playing on a youth rink. I mean, I went to games, it's a loyal that way, right? It's awful, it was awful. So they disappeared, and that was the end of indoor soccer in Philadelphia. So, quick history. Um, Again, mainly notable because we were the hotbed for the, the indoor games we know today, um, uh, but and it's still fondly remembered. And, uh, and like all of us, we like you, know, you asked a good question. I mean, why I watch the games on YouTube. David and I talk about it all the time. It's not the game we remember. I don't know if there's any fix. I like the idea of the diagonal corners, yeah. but uh, I think I mean I think we can all agree a lot of it's quality of play. Outdoors here, and that's great. MLS is the most successful league in American history, and that's wonderful. But all those players that used to play indoor to make some money are not there. So anyway, that's Philadelphia. Now we're going to hear about North Jersey and then New York. But uh, thank you for your time. And I, I don't want to day touch about I just want to say one thing. We as Sash, we really were concerned that as MLS is booming, outdoor is the game, and that's great. But Indoor soccer carried the sport in this country yeah. from, you know, 78 until 96. It was the only place where Americans got to play. I mean, Joey thinks a great example. All we did outdoor was score goals, but Gordon Bradley wouldn't play him. Eddie Fermani wouldn't play him. He'd go indoor, bang, you know, and, 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 and goalkeeper, you know, Chris Piccaro, goalkeepers, players. It was, it's, it, it, and it's been forgotten. The hall ignores it, and we talk about it all the time. And so we don't want to. So that's what we wanted to focus. We're here in Baltimore, not far from the arena. We wanted to focus on indoors, so we hope you enjoy it. And I'll turn it over to our esteemed president, Mr. Thomas.